All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Looks like it's going to be a beautiful day, and so we're thankful to God that we have this opportunity to worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we appreciate your presence. Uh, let's continue, as always, to remember all these on our continuing prayer list. Um, Jacqueline's not having a good day, but she's here. So, uh, But she's in a lot of uh, pain. She kind of overdid it, and so uh, she's in a lot of pain. But we appreciate her so much for being here. She, she does have a doctor's appointment tomorrow, kind of the pre-op stuff in Nashville. Two doctor's appointments tomorrow in Nashville. Uh, so please pray for her that, 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 that everything goes well there. Uh, Joe Ben has come home from THC uh, from his rehab, so he's doing very well. He's over the COVID, and, uh, so hip-wise he's doing well, but as Bobby can tell you, it takes a while to get through all that stuff, so he, he's still got a ways to go, but we're glad that he's home and, and he's doing better, so continue to pray for him. Uh, Charlotte Fouts Payne, we had her up there, took her off. We're going to put her back because she's got a spot on her liver. So they're doing some chemo treatments for that. Other than that, she's been doing better and been doing well, but she does have that. So uh, she'd like us to continue to pray for her. So we'll put her back up there, Charlotte Fouts Payne. So please remember her. Uh, I think that's all I have. If there's anything else you think I need to know, let me know that. We'll try to announce that tonight. Uh, there is an upcoming gospel meeting, and I put the flyer in the back, uh, North Bradley down in Cleveland. be having a meeting on March the 24th through the 27th. Uh, T.J. Kirk will be doing the preaching there, and that will be 7 o'clock each night. Uh, so like I said, there's some information in the back on that. So we're going to turn the song service over to Brother Cheryl. The appropriate time, Cheryl will lead us in the opening prayer, and then Brother Bobby will have our dismissal prayer. <coughs> Morning, everyone. Morning. Please get your song book and turn to number 272. There's <coughs> a sweet and glorious thought that comes to me. I live on. Yes, I live on. Jesus saved my soul from death and now I'm free. I'll live on, yes I'll live on. I'll live on, yes I'll live on. Through eternity I'll live on. I'll live on, yes I'll live on. Through eternity I'll live on. Eternal. 
number 303. Oh, we'll sign this one, have an opening prayer. Number 303. Oh, I have a home prepared where the sights I used to buy just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there we Just over in the glory land, I am on my way to those mansions fair. Just over in the glory land, there to sing God's praise and His glory share. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, I'll join. Father, I pray now for our soldiers, our military, our first responders, our police, 
that are serving our country around, around this world and in this country and in this town. I pray for all of them. They deal with hardships every day. Give them peace of mind to deal with these things. We need to pray for nurses and doctors also in, in this. Give them peace of mind in knowing that they have the hardships that they deal with trying to help people here on earth. Father, I pray that we'll all take something away from here today. We'll listen attentively and let it get into our heart to bring more spirit into our lives, more Holy Spirit into our lives. Father, I ask you now to guide us in all we do. Guide us through another lesson of our word that we might be attentive. Be with Brother Mark as he may bring this lesson this morning. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please turn to Psalm book number 105. Let's find this prayer of the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> into the ceremony without thinking of it for really mean, its real meaning. We may forget the sacrifice of Christ was made on our behalf. We may come to the communion with unconfessed sin. We also may allow the sacrament to become a cold, lifeless, formal ritual just going through the motions. I'm going to read Luke, the 22nd chapter, beginning verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, 
I will not any more eat thereof until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Let us pray. Father God, we come before your throne asking you to bless this bread that we're about to break. Help us to remember the sacrifice that your son did for us. We ask this in his name. Amen. thank you for that sacrifice that Jesus did for each of us. We thank you for that sacrifice and help us to remember that his blood is a path to salvation if we follow his commandment. Go with us as we partake of this and forgive us of our sins. In his precious name we pray. Supper. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, verse 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, and let every one of you lay by in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Let us pray. Father God, you know our hearts. Help us to obey your commandments. And among those commandments is to help our brothers, sisters that are in need, whether they be of a household of your our faith or, or whether they be in our community. Help us to help others. Go with us and as we participate in this gift giving and help us to remember others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. songbook and turn to number 339. Christ. 
to me more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness, see, more of his love who died for me, more about Jesus and his word, holy communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving for the sea, more of his love who died for me, more about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own, more of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming grants of peace, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving for the sea, more of his love who died for me. Please put your markers at number 149. Number 149 will be the song of invitation after the lesson. And Cheryl and I must be on the same wavelength, but I feel bad for Cheryl because that's a scary thought if he's, he's in my head. But that's two weeks in a row. That he said something in the prayer that led directly into what I'm talking about. And I didn't tell him what I was going to be preaching about today. But he mentioned in his prayer about how we need to make this congregation grow. And just the church in general. We, we need to bring more people in to hear the gospel. And that's exactly what I'm going to be preaching on today. So I don't know how he knew that. But anyway, we appreciate that good prayer. We know that Jesus commanded us. In Mark 16 and 15, we are told to take the gospel, not just to some places, we're told to take the gospel to every creature, everywhere in the world. Jesus told us that in Matthew 16 and 15. Now, he also said, if we looked at Matthew 22 and verses 37 through 40, we also noticed that Jesus said we must love God and we must love our fellow man. We've, we've often talked about that, and that basically sums up all the commands of God, that if I love God and I love, if I love my fellow man, then I'm going to be doing everything that this Bible tells me to do. So if we're doing that, if we have a sincere love for God, if we do truly love our fellow man, and we don't just say we do, but we actually do it, then that should mean that you and I should have an earnest desire to go out and, and teach the gospel to a lost and dying world whenever we have the opportunity to do so. You don't always have opportunity, but we should jump on those when we do get them. And it should be something that's important to us and to teach other people. There are lost souls all around us, and they need to hear the gospel. So the question is, why aren't we doing it? And when I say we, I don't mean just the members of this congregation. I'm talking about the church as a whole. That's what I mean by we. So you and I are, are culpable as well, but we're talking about everybody. Why aren't we doing it? Well, some will say, well, well we are doing it. We're, we're going out there. But if that's true, then the numbers would seem to indicate that we are doing a pretty poor job of it. And again, we being in the collective since you and I bear that responsibility as well. According to some studies that and I looked at quite a few a while back, but according to some studies, the church has been hemorrhaging, losing members at a rate of about 2,000 people per month. And that's been going on for the last several years. 2,000 souls a month leaving the church. But we're not even talking about bringing new people in. That's just the people that have been here, and for whatever reason, they're, they're leaving. So what we're seeing is the church is shrinking 
while at the very same time, wickedness, like a fatal tumor, has just been growing and growing. And it shouldn't be any surprise that those two things go together. If God's influence is shrinking, well, then wickedness is going to flourish. And God relies on us to promote his influence, because if we're not going to do it, who will? So it is not just time. We can't say, well, it's time for us to, no, no, no. It's well past time for us to stop being silent. It is well past time for us to stop being apathetic, lethargic, lazy, however you want to describe it. It's past time for us to stand up for God. Too many people haven't done that, and we see the, the condition our culture is in right now because of that. We need to stand up for God. We need to focus our energy on taking the gospel to the lost. Now, we have to ask, since we're, we haven't been doing a good job of that, well, what is stopping us? What is our excuse for not doing a better job with this? Well, the short answer is we don't have one. We really don't have an excuse because we face far less persecution as God's people than so many people have faced throughout history. We really don't have an excuse. Well, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. They had real things to worry about. So let me give you a couple of examples of some people who faced serious persecution for standing up for their religious beliefs. Now, a couple of these guys I would have a lot of disagreements with because we don't see eye to eye religiously on, on every topic. But these are people who stood up for what they believed in. They believed it was necessary to stand up for God and to stand up for the Bible. And so I can admire them from that sense that at least they had a dedication. And, and we would agree on some biblical things, but we would disagree on others. But these were people that were seriously persecuted all because they stood up for God. So first of all, the, the top person here, that's Martin Luther. Not to be confused with Martin Luther King Jr., it's a totally different person and time period, but Martin Luther worked in the Catholic Church in the 1500s. He saw that a lot of the things that the Catholics were teaching, he saw that it was wrong. He was a Catholic. But he's like, you know what? Some of the stuff we're saying is not in the Bible. We're making things up. And that bothered him. Because he said, that, you know, that's going to cause people to be lost. We're telling them that the Bible says one thing and it really doesn't say that. Now, we may say, well, why didn't people just read it for themselves? Again, another excuse we don't have. Because we have easy access to Bibles. They're relatively cheap. We have them here in English. If this was in the original Greek, I'd be in big trouble. Because I couldn't read much of it. If the Old Testament was in the original Hebrew, I'd be even in even bigger trouble. So we don't have that excuse. We have access to the Bible. We can read it. A lot of the people in this time period did not have access. Because Bibles were exorbitantly expensive. And I'm talking about it cost you several thousand dollars in today's money. To purchase a Bible. A lot of these people were very poor. They couldn't afford it even if they wanted to get one. And then the other problem was that the Catholic Church made sure that all the Bibles that were published, they were all published in Latin. And very few people outside of the Catholic priest could read Latin. Right? So most people, they didn't have access to the Bible. They were dependent upon what the church told them. And so Martin Luther correctly realized, he said, look, we have a serious responsibility here. Since they can't read it for themselves, we better get it right. Souls are on the line. They're depending on us to tell them what they need to do to get to heaven because they can't check it out for themselves. And we are abusing that because we're teaching things that just simply are not biblical. They are not correct. And so Luther stood up for this. He will be persecuted because how dare you question the Pope and the church? And he did dare. And it's not like he didn't know 
well, I'm sure they'll be okay with it. They won't bother me. Oh, he knew. He knew he was stirring up a hornet's nest. But he felt like, you know what? This is what God would want me to do. God would want me to stand up for him and call out something. If this is false doctrine, it needs to be called out. And the truth needs to be taught. So he knew that's what God would expect him to do. So the church persecuted him. They told him he needed to shut up and he needed to take back all he had said. And he refused to do that. And so the Pope dropped the nuclear bomb on him at the time, which was excommunication, which meant you were kicked out of the church with the Catholics taught. You know, if you're kicked out of the Catholic church, it's impossible to go to heaven. So what the Pope was doing was condemning Luther to hell. Okay, well, that didn't work with Luther because he knew, well, the Bible doesn't say that. You don't have authority to send me to hell. Only God can do that. No man has that kind of authority. So it didn't work like the Pope thought it would. But for most people, that was, a, oh, no, he's been, he's been kicked out of the church, right? So once that didn't work, then the government got involved. Okay, Luther lived in what at the time was known as the Holy Roman Empire. Today, what would be Germany, Central Europe. Not to be confused with the Roman Empire, which we're studying on Wednesday night. This was the Holy Roman Empire. And so that government, which was very heavily Catholic, then they got involved. And the emperor declared that Luther was an outlaw in a document known as the Edict of Worms. He declared Luther an outlaw, which carried with it a death penalty offense. So he declared not only is the Pope kicked him out of the church and he's still doing this, well, we're going to hunt this guy down like an animal we're going to kill him simply for standing up for what he saw as biblical truth. Now, fortunately for Luther, he had a lot of good friends who were willing to hide him and so he never got caught. They would have probably burned him at the stake if they'd gotten their grubby little fingers on him, but they never did catch him. But at the same time, what that meant was for the rest of Luther's earthly existence, he was a man on the run. He was a man constantly looking over his shoulder. Is the Holy Roman Empire's army going to catch me? Is the Pope going to catch me? He had to worry about that all the time. Simply, again, because he decided to stand up and say, we're teaching things that are false and we need to teach what the Bible says. Well, let's look at a second example. Thomas More, who's the... The bottom figure there, I don't know how well you can see that, but same basic time period in the 1500s. Thomas More was a devout Catholic, so again, he and I would disagree on some things, but, but Thomas More believed that you should stand up for what you believe in. You should stand up for what he considered to be biblical truth. And so the big issue of his day, he was a, a very close friend and advisor of King Henry VIII, who's probably the most famous monarch in all of European history, or, or infamous, we should say, for all kinds of reasons, but one of which was he was tired of his wife, Catherine of Aragon, and he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn. And he was determined he was going to do that. He was going to divorce Catherine and marry Anne Boleyn, and he went to the Pope to get permission, and the Pope said, no, you can't do that. And so Henry, that's when he's going to create his own church. Well, fine, I'll just make my own church then. Right? If you're not going to do what I want, I'll just make my own church. People do that today all the time. I don't like what that church says. I'll just make my own. Does God give any of us authority to do that? Of course not. There's one true church, and we better be a part of it. Well, Henry makes his own church, and, but he's not going to stop there. He's going to demand that everybody take an oath in the country that they publicly proclaim that Henry has a right to marry Anne Boleyn. And if you don't take that oath, you're going to get about this much shorter. I'm going to help you lose some weight. We're going to get rid of that bowling ball that's on top of your neck, right? So they would cut your head off. Well, again, Thomas More had been a mentor to Henry and had taught him, tutored him growing up. And, and the sad thing is Henry knew a lot about the Bible. But he chose, like a lot of people, well, I'm going to ignore the parts I don't like and go with what I want. So he saw every kind of justification for this divorce and, and marriage to Anne Boleyn, and Thomas More would not cave in. 
And Thomas More told Henry, look, you don't have a right to marry Anne Boleyn. You cannot do that. In God's eyes, you're still married to Catherine of Aragon. And, and Thomas More was correct. That's what the Bible teaches. Because you can't do that. Well, you don't tell Henry VIII, no, he can't do something. And if anybody could have gotten away with it, it would have been Thomas More. I wish I had more time to delve into their friendship. I mean, they, they, they were tight. And for a while, Henry tried to ignore that, but eventually he's just like, no, no, look, you've got to, you got to come on board, Thomas, like everybody else. And Thomas More would not do it. And as a result, he lost his head. Henry had him executed because he would not agree to a marriage that God did not agree to. And so these people, when they were executed back in the day, you know, they were allowed to say a few last words and and so among, and it's a great speech, you get a chance to read it and see what Thomas More said right before they killed him. It's, it's a wonderful speech. But one of the last things he said, I don't know if you can read that, but he said, I die the king's faithful servant, but God's first. And that's the way we all have to be. We cannot follow men if they are taking us away from God. We need to be God's servant first. And so it cost Thomas More his life for standing up and saying the Bible says you can't do this. Well, how about a biblical example very similar to Thomas More? What about John the Baptist? Right? Same situation. So he tells King Herod he had a woman he called his wife, Herodias, which was really his brother Philip's wife, and John the Baptist dared to point that out to him. Hey, she's not your wife. She's really your brother's wife. You can't be married to her. Says who? Says God. That's not a valid marriage. And so we know the story. Herod put him in jail, and then eventually Herodias, his wicked so-called wife, really his brother's wife that he's living in adultery with, she found a way to get John the Baptist executed because her husband made a foolish promise. And so John the Baptist, like Thomas More, lost his head. For what? Because he was standing up for what God said. Even though it was unpopular, even though some people didn't like it, he stood up. So I could give you a thousand other examples, but you get the point, right? There are people in the past who suffered serious persecution for trying to take the gospel out to the world. You and I most likely are not going to be beheaded by the government for standing up for what God said. So we don't have that excuse as well. Our persecution is just so bad we can't bear it that's not true. So we really don't have an excuse. We have to fulfill the Great Commission. We have to do what Jesus said. We have to spread the gospel so that the church, which is God's kingdom on earth, comprised of his faithful children, we have to do that so that the church can and will grow. Because God has said, if we'll do that, the church will grow. It's not growing because we're not doing it. God's plan is always the perfect plan. And so today and tonight, we want to examine a few ways that you and I can help the church to grow. What, what can I do? What can you do to grow this congregation and also just the church in general? We want to spread the gospel around the world like Jesus told us to do. So we want to look at seven ways we can do that. So Lord willing, this morning, we're going to look at four of those. And then tonight, we'll... We'll look at three other ones, okay? So what can we do to help the church grow? First of all, we need to have knowledge. And we mean this in a couple of ways. First of all, we need to know and we need to understand that the world is full of people who are not in Christ. I think we all know that, but we better know it. There are lost people all around us. They are not in Christ. And if something is not done about that, there will come a day when they will be lost eternally. They will be condemned to an eternal hell. And at that point, it will be too late to do anything about it. Right now, we have time to do something about it. We need to recognize that, that these people are going to be lost unless they obey the gospel. We'll turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's see what happens to people who don't obey the gospel. And we're supposed to know this. We're supposed to have this knowledge that should motivate us. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, 
when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Those people will be permanently separated from a loving God. Well, we have to know that. We have to understand that. And we also need to know that God requires each of us, every single one of us, not just the preacher, not just the elders, not just brother so-and-so, you and me, regardless of whether I'm the preacher or not, we all have that responsibility that God requires each of us to be involved in spreading the gospel. Look at eight, Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. God requires every single Christian, man, woman, young, old, doesn't matter, to be involved in spreading the gospel. Eight, Acts 8, 4. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. All of Jesus' followers. It wasn't just the apostles. Everybody was commanded to do that. He didn't just tell, okay, well, I want Peter, you do it, and Matthew, you do it, Paul, you do it. And, no, it was, if you're a follower of Christ, then you've got to be doing this. Now, we've often said, God will not hold us accountable for conversions. God is not going to look at me on the day of judgment and say, Mark, how many people did you baptize? He will not hold me accountable for that. But what he will hold me accountable for, Mark, how many opportunities did I give you and how many of those opportunities did you try to teach the gospel? That's what I will be held accountable for. Here's an opportunity here. Why didn't you teach, the, why didn't you say something to that person? Give them a pamphlet, do something. Why did you let that slide when you had an opportunity there? That's what I will be held accountable Not whether or not they ever converted or whether they were baptized, but did when I had an opportunity to talk to somebody about the gospel, did I take advantage of that opportunity? They may spit in my face. They may tell me, get away from me, you're a Jesus freak, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Yeah, that might happen. But that's not my fault. I did what I was supposed to do. If they reject it, that's on them. Okay, so God's not going to hold us accountable for conversions, but he will hold us accountable for making the effort. For I tried, Lord, to fulfill the Great Commission. I tried to talk to the people I had offered. There's a gazillion people in this world I'll never have the opportunity to talk to. And God understands that. But some people, I will have the opportunity. What did I do with it? That's what he's going to want to know. So we can and must teach those people what they need to do. I mean, we can't force them to obey the gospel, but we can teach them about what they need to do. So we need to understand, if you look at 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, we've got to understand there are lost people. We have to have the knowledge of that. We have to have the knowledge that we are required to try to say something to them. And then finally, we've got to have the knowledge about God's word. What, what am I supposed to teach them? If I don't have the knowledge of God's word, then how can I possibly talk to somebody about Jesus? I've got to have that knowledge. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved. Study the scriptures. Approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, of rightly dividing the word of God. God wants me to study the word, and he wants you to study the word. Look at 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. We have to have the knowledge of the scripture so that we can fulfill the Great Commission. We can teach people. 1 Peter 3 and 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, that means in your mind. You know this. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We have to be ready with an answer. If somebody walks up to me and says, oh, I, I heard you're a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Why are you a Christian? Well, I don't know. It seemed like a good idea. I don't know. What can you tell me about Jesus? Well, not much. I, you know, he's a good guy. What does the Bible say about it? Well, I really don't know. I haven't read it. I guess I should. Right? Those are not answers. I have to be able to give somebody out. Why do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me, let me show you from the Scriptures. Here's why I believe this. Because God said so. And let me show you where that is. Right? We, we've got to have that knowledge. Now, some people will use that as an excuse and say, well, but I don't know everything 
that there is in the Bible. I don't know it all. I'll let y'all in on a little secret. Neither do I. Nobody does. That's not an excuse. Okay? And if I don't know a lot, then I better get studying. I better get busy. I need to learn more. All right? But I'm never going to know it all. If I live to be a thousand years old and study the Bible every day, I guarantee you there would still be things in there I don't know. And God understands that. Okay? But I, have, I can't just say, well, you know what? I'm just going to close the Bible and forget it. I can't know it all, so I might as well not know any of it. That's a foolish idea. I need to learn as much of this as I can so I have a better chance to teach people. And it's okay to admit to those people that you may not have all the answers, but you'll find somebody who does. No shame in that. But so we can't put off until we know everything. I'll teach people when I know everything. Well, that, that'll be the first of never when that will happen. But some people will do that. But we need to be knowledgeable. We can't know it all but we can be knowledgeable. We can know the important things. So these are some areas we've got to have knowledge so that we can spread the gospel. We can grow the church. Secondly, we need to be willing to seek the lost. We have to seek the lost. We are to teach the world. Jesus said, you know, take it to every creature. Does that mean that we all have to go overseas to do it? Of course not. There are some people, there are missionaries. They go to India, they go to all kinds of places, and God bless them. But that Jesus wasn't saying that you and I, we all have to do that. We all have to travel the world, and he wasn't saying that. But he said between all of the Christians, we've got to reach everybody because there, there are Christians over there. Well, that's their responsibility, right? So we don't have to do that, but there is a huge missionary field Yes, in India and in Africa and in Europe and different places. Guess where else there's a huge missionary field? Etowah, Tennessee. Well, I just I don't have enough money to go to uh, South Africa. Well, you don't need it. I mean, that'd be a great thing if you could go there. But there are lost souls. How many thousands of lost souls do we have within a mile of this building? I don't know, a lot. And we all know that. So that's a missionary field. We all have family. We have friends. We have neighbors. We have coworkers, people that we know. They are lost, and they need the gospel. So we have a missionary field right here in our own backyard. We don't have to go halfway around the world. Like I said, if you can do that, that's wonderful. But it's not necessary that everybody do that. But we have to go to these people. Remember that in Mark 16, 15, Jesus told them, that action verb, go and teach every creature. That's what Jesus said, right? He didn't tell his disciples, okay, boys, you see there's a, there's a bench over here. I want y'all to sit right there on that bench and don't move, and all the lost will come to you. It's not what my Bible says. Don't worry about it. They'll all come, they'll come flocking. Yeah, that'd be great if that were true, but that's not the truth. Okay, they're not going to come. We are told to go. We have to seek the law. We can't just open the church doors. Hey, if we just unlock the doors, they're going to come flooding in here. Well, we can see that didn't work. I'm glad y'all are here, but there are plenty of other people on this street, in this neighborhood, that they need to be in here too, but they're not going to come in just because we opened the doors. I wish it were that simple, but that's not the case. We can't just expect, well, as long as we sit in here and say, hey, okay, we're open, come on in, and just expect thousands of people to pour in here. It's just not reality. It's not going to happen. Now, some of you are probably fishermen. I've tried it a couple of times. I was really lousy at it, so didn't have much patience for it. Wanted the fish to jump in the boat, and they didn't seem to want to do that. But, but some of you probably are fishermen. You've fished a lot in your life. And, and let me ask you this. How many fish do you catch sitting at home on your couch? I'm willing to say probably none. The fish don't come up to your house and ring the doorbell. Hey, I want to jump in your net. Doesn't work that way, right? You have to go to where the fish are. You have to go to the lake or the river or the ocean or wherever it is. You have to go to where the fish are. They ain't coming to you. But the lost are just like that. We have to go to where the lost are because they're not just going to come in here of their own. I mean, occasionally somebody will. That's wonderful. 
But we can't bank on that and just sit here and wait for that. We've got to go to where they are. So look at Mark chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. We want to catch fish. We've got to go get them. Mark 1, 16, 17. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he, being Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. See, they were where the fish were. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Right? You and I are to be fishers of men, so we have to go where the men are. We have to go where the lost souls are if we're going to fulfill the gospel. Now, turn to the very next chapter, same verses, 16 and 17, but Mark chapter 2 this time. Jesus spent time with sinners because he wanted to be around those people who needed him, and that's what you and I have to do. We've got to be around people that need us. Mark 2, 16, 17, when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You and I cannot afford to wait for lost souls to come to us. We must go out to where the lost souls are are to be found. And as I said, we don't have to go halfway around the world. There's plenty around us where we live right here. So we have to have the knowledge. We have to be willing to seek the lost. Third, we have to have the proper attitude. Turn over to Proverbs 11 and verse 2. We've got to approach people with the spirit of Christ. We have to be Christ-like when we talk about people, which means that we need to approach them with humility. We need to be humble, not arrogant, not self-righteous. <laughs> I'm saved and you're not. You need me. You're a loser. Yeah, well, you got that attitude, you're never going to teach anybody. And yet I've seen people with that attitude. That they just come off as, I'm better than you are. I know it, you know it, so you need to come up with me. That's not the way we're supposed to do this. God wants humility. Proverbs 11 and verse 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. You and I need to recognize I'm not holier than thou. I'm a person trying to, a flawed human being, trying to do my best to get to heaven, and I'm going to try to do my best to help other people come with me. But we're all in the same boat, and, and we need to recognize that. Look at James chapter 4, verses 6 and verse 10. So many scriptures with this same message. James chapter 4, verse 6, and then look at verse 10. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. That's a hymn that we sing sometimes based on that. Humble yourselves. Don't have an arrogant attitude that, well, I'm better than everybody else, and they just need to bask in my wisdom. That is totally the wrong attitude. Look at Philippians 2 and verse 3. The Bible says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. We're also told in the Bible, yeah, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. I'm a flawed human being just like everybody else, but we're all trying to get to heaven together. So it's not an attitude of superiority. It's an attitude of we're all here to help each other. And that's what we want to do. We all needed somebody to teach us the gospel. We needed somebody to be humble with us and compassionate with us. Well, now it's our turn. We need to do that with other people. So if we have this haughty, arrogant, self-righteous, condescending attitude, we're never going to reach anybody. Nobody's going to listen to us. And we will be committing a sin against God. We'll be doing that ourselves what we're accusing other people of doing. So let's make sure that we have the right attitude. And then finally this morning, we need to build relationships. Build relationships. We cannot immediately, just the first time we see somebody, just hit them over the head with a Bible. And some people, that they think that's the best. Well, just slam them right off the bat. Okay, you do that, they're going to go screaming in the opposite direction. You'll never see them again. Right? They're going to be like the old vampire movies. <laughs> you know, they're going to, that's not the way to do it. Now, you can't hit somebody over the head with the Bible. That usually hurts a whole lot more than it helps. What we've got to do is 
cultivate a relationship, build a relationship of mutual respect, and then those lost people are going to be much more likely to be willing to listen to what you have to say. If you've shown them respect and courtesy, and again, you can hit them with that immediately, right? But as soon as you get a pretty good relationship, then, hey, you know, I've been wanting to talk to you about something. You know, find a way to work it in to do this, but you've got to be careful about how you do it because the idea is you want to reach people. You don't want to turn them off before you've really had a chance to to teach the gospel. So an example that happened with us, we had a lady, she was the mother of a member, and we had been working, she was a Baptist, she'd gone to the Baptist church all her life, and we'd been working on her and working on her and cultivating this relationship, Amen. building a relationship, right? And working in whenever we could. We'd talk a little bit about the Bible and you know, didn't bash her or what she was doing, but just, hey, you know, this is what it says about this and things like that. And so we had gotten her to where she would actually come to worship services occasionally. And because I knew her and, you know, she would typically come if I was going to preach, which shows how desperate she was, I guess. But if I was going to preach, I would fill in occasionally here and there, you know, and she would, so we would invite her. Well, if you're going to preach, yeah, I'll, I'll come, you know. So she would come and she would listen, and I would try to put things in the sermon that maybe could be beneficial to her, you know, not directly calling her out and that sort of thing. And so we had worked with her and worked with her for several years and felt like we were making progress. You know, she would start and ask, well, what about this, you know? You'd show it to her, and she, well, I never really realized that. You know, so thought, okay, we're, we're getting somewhere. Sometimes it just, it's, it's like farming, right? you got to cultivate the crops, and it's, it takes a little bit of time, and you don't get the instant gratification, but it was working. And then so one of those days, she came to the service, and I guess I was preaching that day, and she came, and, you know, we got to the end of the service, and everybody's going out, and, this brother came up to her, and I know, I know him, and I know he was well-meaning. He got right in her face and said, you know you're going to burn in hell, don't you, if you don't get out of that, you know, and just let her have it. <clears throat> Years worth of work destroyed in two minutes. She said, I'll never come back, I'll never, and she never did. And a couple of years ago, she passed away, still in a lost state. We were getting somewhere with her and he destroyed it like that because he confronted her and he's trying to hit her over the head with it. You need to do it, you know, and everything he said was true. But it's like there's a certain way to say things. You can't just beat somebody up even if your intentions are good. And I know they were. He was very well-meaning, but it just destroyed all that work. So we've got to build relationships with people. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Have a genuine love and compassion for them, and when they see that, then they will listen. And now abide of faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity, and that word charity there means love. The greatest thing, you can love someone. If they see that, you can get them to listen. And they still may not convert, but, but that, my point is that's the only real chance that you have. You can get them to listen. Well, let's close out with Mark 6, 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. His compassion, his love came out. That's why he didn't beat them over the head with it. But he showed them he loved them. He was concerned about them. And they were willing to listen to what he had to say. So those that we're trying to reach, they must be able to tell that we truly care about them. Again, it's not about winning an argument. Too many people, that's the way they see it. Well, I want to prove you wrong. No, you just want to be able to show them what the Bible says. Help, help them come to their own conclusion. That's what I had to do because I was stubborn. And they wanted to teach me, boy, I was going to prove them wrong, right? And, you know, so I had the wrong attitude, but they just kept, no, 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 well, let's just look at this. Let's look, you know, and finally, I was able to see the light, okay? 
But once I began to realize, well, these people obviously care about me. They've invested a lot of time in me. Maybe I should listen to what they have to say. And, you know, it, it took a while, but it, it started to sink in. And so we got to we got to cultivate that relationship. Now, when I was teaching school, we do all these in-service things, and I can say this now because I don't teach there anymore. Most of those things were a colossal waste of time. That would have got me called in on a carpet if I'd said it then, right? But we all felt, oh man, here we are wasting all day doing this stuff, you know. But occasionally you get a nugget. Say, oh, that's useful. I can actually use that in my classroom. And so we would hear this often, but I found it to be true. It's a true thing. And so they were telling us about building relationships as, as a teacher with your students, right? Build a relationship with the kids in your class. And, because they, they told us, they said, look, students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right? They don't care that I can tell them everything about Henry VIII. They could care less. I think it's cool, but i got to be able to convince them of that, right? But they don't care how much history knowledge I had in my head, but once I showed them that I really cared about them and I was there to help them on this journey, try to do better, then I could get somewhere with them. Then they would kind of listen to what I was trying to teach them. Well, it's the same thing in the spiritual realm, right? It doesn't matter how much Bible I know, if people don't understand that I'm doing this out of love, it's not out of hate, it's not, it's, I'm not trying to win an argument, it's because I love you and I care about you and I'm worried about you and there's some information that you need to know that I think could be really helpful to you. And if they sense that, then that's when you can get somewhere with somebody. And again, it's not, it, it can't be fake, it's got to be genuine, right? So if we love, like I said, if we love God and we're supposed to really love our fellow man, that needs to be genuine, that we really love these people and we're worried about their souls. If that's true with you, that will come out. Let them see that. And that's when you can maybe reap the harvest at some point, right? Well, that's four. Like I said, tonight, Lord willing, if you'll come back at six o'clock tonight, we want to look at three other ways that if we have these right things in our head that we can reach people, we can teach people, and hopefully we can help the church to grow. So this morning, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. We can baptize you into Christ, and God will add you to his church, and you need to do that before it's everlastingly too late. If, on the other hand, you are a Christian, but you have fallen away, you've gone back into the world for whatever reason, you can come forward, we can pray with you and for you, and God has promised if you'll confess those sins, repent for them, ask for his forgiveness, he'll forgive you, and you'll be restored, and you will no longer be in that lost condition that we were talking about. So if you have a need, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. Our cudgels of Jesus fallen tenderly upon your ear. Sweet is cry of blood and pity fallen. Turn and listen, stay and hear. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord, pray. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Take his yoke, for he is meek and lowly, bear his burden to him turn. He who calleth is the master holy, he will teach if you will learn. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will.
Thank you so much for your kind attention. Hope to see you tonight at six. <clears throat> and I always take the time, Brother Mark. He always does a good job. We need to take this lesson to heart, all of us do. We all know. I don't know if anybody knows, but we all know that we know somebody that we can reach out to, family and others. The Lord knows that I've, I've stepped on my family's toes a bunch of times here lately, and I've not been successful, but hopefully sometime it will find through. We'll see, but we need to reach others also. Please remember that. That's not being ugly to anybody, that's just facts. We all need to, we all need to do what we're supposed to do. Please remember, always, all, all those on our prior list, keep them in your prayers. Say a prayer for them. Each time you say a prayer, remember them in your prayers. Remember, uh, those have hardships in their lives. We need to pray for them and try to help them through their hardships. Always remember, as Mark said, Thursday night, 6 o'clock. Thursday, Wednesday night, Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. Again, next Sunday morning, Bible study at 9 30, regular service at 10 30. We all need to attend. Please turn your song books to number 46. Let's sing the first verse of this and we'll have a closing prayer. <laughs> Bless be the ties that bind our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kin with mine is like to that of love. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we're able to be here this morning and, and worship. And to, and to find the truth that we can believe in. We pray that you would help each one of us to try to do the best, the very, very best that we can in order to obey, obey thy, thy word. We pray that you would be with the leaders of our land. We pray that they would try to be Christ-like in their, their uh, government to bring the goodness out into all of us who they govern. We pray too that you would be with all the military, the uh, EMTs, the doctors and nurses, the school teachers, it's all the people that we should rely, rely on to hear the truth. We also Thank you for those who are protecting us, especially those who are in harm's, in harm's way while they're protecting us. Some of us, they give everything they got to never make it home. And we know that they were trying to do the best they could. Some of them may not have even been saved at the time. They were trying hard, hard. But we pray that you got a place for them too. We pray that you would go with us now to our homes and be with us until the next morning hour that we would be back. We 
we pray that you would forgive us for all of our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.